right, so it's a rainy Friday morning. We are at Avid Brewing Stop Time Series with Frank Williams. This is Ray Matthews Brown on the only take we're going to do, take one. Let it roll. Hello, everybody. We're going to talk about uh, a guy who is an amazing musician. But to most people, he's like an unsung hero. To bass players, he is the man. But to most people, they have no idea. Born in Pittsburgh in 1926 with the given name Raymond Matthew Brown. He grew up in a kind of middle-class family uh, in the hill section of Pittsburgh, in that same section that um, Billy Strayhorn and Errol Garner and um, Bohana would have grown up in. And uh, like most kids in that area, there are a lot of piano teachers around and all the middle-class families had pianos in the house, so he started out playing piano. And that's what he did for most of his youth. Good piano player. And uh, that probably is why he was such a unique bass player. Such a great understanding of harmony and melody and, uh, and, and rhythm. Okay, and arrangements and uh, give and take and all that. Um, he got to high school and uh, he looked around and there were piano players everywhere. So he goes, oh, this isn't good. I got too much competition here. What am I going to do? So he decided he would become a trombone player. But unfortunately, there was not enough money in the family for a trombone. So he discovered that there was a jazz band in the school, and the jazz band needed a bass player, a string bass player, and the string bass was just laying over there. So he learned to play the string bass and played in his school jazz orchestra. It was a quick study for him. He already had the musical background, the ear and everything could read and all that. And as a very young man, he became pretty famous around Pittsburgh as a bass player. And of course, there were a lot of jazz around Pittsburgh, so there were plenty of older, more experienced bass players that he could learn from, and he did. So it wasn't so much that he had all of this great classical training and conservatory training and blah, 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 blah. He learned the true way from other masters from those who came before him. And things were going well for him. He's playing gigs, he's playing with all the big bands around, and you know, he's making a pretty good living. Things are going great. But people start moving through town, and he finds out where they're going, and where they're living, and where the action is, and he discovered a 52nd in New York City. And so, at 18 or 19, he started making his plan. I'm going to New York. And at 20 years of age, he bought himself a one-way ticket to New York. Now, I want to say it one more time. He didn't have an alternative plan. No, he bought a one-way ticket to New York. He was going to do this, and that was that. He already had a um, uh, knowledge and familiarity with Hank Jones, a great piano player from the Jones family based in the uh, Detroit area, had moved to New York and was starting to make noise there. So as soon as he got to New York, he connected with Hank Jones. And wouldn't you know, Hank Jones connected him with the one and the only John Birch Gillespie Dizzy. Dizzy happened to be looking for a bass player. He heard Ray play and went, oh yeah, hired him on the spot. So here this cat comes from Pittsburgh at 20 years of age on a one-way ticket and within a matter of days, he's already playing with Dizzy Gillespie. That's who Ray Brown was at 20, okay? So now you put that in perspective, show up and take over. That's just the way that was with him. And he played in Dizzy's groups, the combos, and the big band. 
uh, he liked arranging an intimacy, so he really preferred the smaller groups. Trio, piano, bass, drum. Got more freedom, got more interplay between the drums and the piano and the bass, and that's what he loved, that freedom, that interplay. And so he was in and out of the Gillespie band for a while and ended up forming a, a trio with his friend Hank Jones, which he worked for a while. But Dizzy was the man, and Dizzy was making the money. And Dizzy started this big band as well. And they were working and making money more than Hank Jones. So, he was doing both things for a while. And then in 1947, Dizzy made a decision. They had to go do a tour of the South. And he knew how we Southern people are. We like our instruments, but we love our singers too. So he went and hired a young lady who had been discovered by Chick Webb. And when Chick met his end, she took over Chick's band for a while. And then she went solo. You know who I'm talking about? I'm talking about none other than the fantastic Miss Ella Fitzgerald. Oh yeah. In 1947, they go on tour together in Gillespie's band down south. Now I don't know what happened down south. Folks don't ask me to be looking at no crystal balls. But you know the South is kind of warm and it must have got kind of hot because before that tour was over, they were, let's just say, familiar with each other to the point they got married. Oh yeah. And as far as I know, although the marriage lasted like about five years because their careers were taken off and pulling them in different directions, they did have a son not biological son, they adopted uh, a young baby that was uh, the child of one of Ella's half-sisters. And they christened him Ray Brown Jr. But somewhere around 1953, they divorced because their careers were just going in different directions, hard to keep the whole thing together. But even after that divorce, They still tour together. They still record together. They were still great friends. And I'm gonna leave it at that. Mm -hmm. Now, about this time, he, Ella's no longer with the Gillespie band. Gillespie just bans the big band and gets back to playing with small combos and this and that. But while he's in the big band, there was a particular rhythm section. Kenny Clark and Milt Jackson playing vibes and John Lewis on piano and of course Ray Brown. And as the big band is doing this thing and they can see that this big band thing is not gonna last very long because it costs too much to feed a big band. They started performing as a separate ensemble among themselves. Are you following this? Yes. They became the modern jazz quartet. Yeah, Ray was the first bass player in there. And this thing came directly out of Dizzy's big band, baby. And it lasted for a while, you know. But Ray always had other things he wanted to do. And he particularly loved that piano bass thing. And he liked the swing and the blues. And John Lewis was going in ways a little bit different than what Ray wanted to go in. And Ray had discovered this other piano player from Canada who was called a Maharaja of the piano by Duke Ellington. We're talking about Mr. Oscar Peterson who could play anything and everything at the same time. Now, before he got around to Oscar, of course, 
through Dizzy, he had met Bird and Art Tatum and got a chance to play with all those guys. So through Bird, he played with everybody. So he knew what was out there. So when he heard Oscar play, he knew that was the real deal. So they formed this trio. And this trio with Oscar Peterson, they stayed together for 14, 15 years. And that's one of the longest relationships uh, that Ray had musically uh, as a jazz player. Now, there was always this demand on him to do other things. So he's a great bass player. And people wanted him in the grooves. What do I mean? They wanted him on record. Oscar had Norman Grants as his producer, who was a lot of concerts and a lot of records. And so next thing you know, Norman is producing a lot of records and getting Ray involved. So Ray's becoming this side man for everybody. And on a lot of those recordings they're doing, Oscar is playing piano right along with him. So that relationship went both as a trio and in the studio. And he kept doing this thing and having a lot of fun with it. Man, he was having a lot of fun with it. But New York got to be a drag for him for whatever reason. And he wanted a little bit slower life. So what does he do? He moves to the West Coast. California, here I come. And it's not like going out there for a gold rush. He's going out there because no matter where he is, he's gonna get work, whether it's in the studios of Paramount or whether it's in the recording studios or just playing gigs or whatever it is, He's going to be there. So he's out there and he is recording and he's playing. He formed a group called the LA4. Had lasted for another 12 years. Oh, man. Um, Rado Almeida on guitar, you know, and Bud Shank on alto sax and flute. And I guess they had uh, one or two uh, uh, different drummers there and pianists and whatnot. But that is what he was doing, as well as touring and recording and doing all the things he's doing. He's even doing his own trios. He's selecting other piano players, other drummers that he's recording with. And he is reaching back into New York for cats he played with back in the day that he loves. He did a series of albums called some of my favorite people are trumpet players. We brought trumpet players into this trio thing. We made a recording of all his favorite trumpet players. Some of my favorite players are sax players. Some of my favorite players are guitar players. Some of my favorite players are trombone players. And he, the great albums. You need to check it out. Like if you've checked out The Tenors of Our Time by Roy Hargrove, you need to check out some of my best friends are this and that and that with Ray Brown. He lays this thing out. So he's continuing to record with everybody, although he always has a go-to group. He even recorded a tune with Steely Dan called Razor Boy. That's right, go listen to Razor Boy, that, that, that Razor Boy. And that bass you hear, that's Mr. Ray Brown. And his sound is so clear, flawless. His technique is flawless. His intonation, flawless. His use of scales, chromaticism, whatever, flawless. So everyone wanted a piece of him. Steel again got that piece on that particular recording. Somewhere around 1980, as he is touring up uh, into Canada, British Columbia, I believe, he meets this little piano player. Now today we know her more as a singer. But when he met her, she was just trying to make it as a jazz pianist. And he heard her and said, you know what? Girl, you got some chops. But you up here in British Columbia, you, you're not going to hear what you need to hear. And you're not going to be with the people you need to be with to give you the culture, the, the, the knowledge, the experience that you need to take you to your greatest potential. So you need to move down 
into the United States. And since you're in British Columbia, why don't you just come on down to LA and I'll introduce you to John Clayton. Yeah, another bass player. He wasn't greedy. He had as much work as he wanted. And Jeff Hamilton. And this young piano player started working with Jeff Hamilton and Clayton. And her name was Diana Crawl. And this is long before Diana Crawl <laughs> ever realized she could sing. <laughs> yeah, she's like Nina Simone and Nat King Cole. All she wanted to do was play piano. And somebody said, I ain't gonna hire you no more because we need a singer in here. So she opened up her mouth and what happened? Boom, gold, platinum, whatever. And for a while, she worked in the same kind of groups that Nat King Cole and Ray Brown worked in, small trios, piano, guitar, bass. She even did a couple of things with Ray Brown, okay? so. Ray Brown had an ear for music and talent, and he helped cultivate it wherever he went. He also had a keen interest in educating the next generation. So his bass book, primarily exercises with scales and technical exercises and whatnot, constructing bass lines, harmonic information, is a must-have book for any serious acoustic bass player. You gotta get Ray Brown's book because he poured everything he learned through his long career in that book. Yes, he did. Did he get Grammys and all that? Not many, because you're a side man, no one cares, but musicians do, musicians do. He was also a composer, and he actually wrote a tune called The Gravy Waltz. <laughs> the Gravy Waltz. He won a Grammy for it. Yeah, he did. And you know the tune. Because if any of you have ever watched the Steve Allen show, you have heard The Gravy Waltz because it became the theme song for the Steve Allen show, which means every time Steve Allen was on TV, Ray Brown got paid. That's right, he wasn't stupid, he was a poor man, he did all that recording, and he made all that money. He had a very, very, very good life. He continued to record, to give lessons, to work with young musicians, Even my son talked about meeting him out in California and having the opportunity to just go one-on-one -on -one with him. And he was just open to doing that and not asking for four or $500 for a bass session, but just out of the goodness of my heart, I see this young cat, he's trying to make it like I was trying to make it. And like the old cats helped me, I'm gonna help him. He had that spirit. Yes, somewhere around that 2002, uh, he was touring, he continued to play and tour, um, and um, he was on tour uh, in the uh, Indianapolis area and uh, decided to go and uh, shoot around a golf uh, before his gig at night and go home and take a nap or go to his hotel and take a nap. And um, he never woke up from that nap. He passed away in August of uh, 2002, I think it was August 23rd, uh, 2002. And he left us all this beautiful music and this great legacy and his namesake, Ray Brown Jr., who continued to stay with his mother, Ella Fitzgerald Wright, uh, until her death as well. Um, he was an honored musician, not just by other musicians. Um, he had an honorary doctorate from the Berkeley School of Music. Austria gave him the honorary cross for science and the arts. And Downbeat gave him a Lifetime Achievement Award as a jazz artist. He was honored. He was appreciated. His music is still with us. 
I was listening to him as I was doing this research, and my God, was he flawless. And more than that, was he a swinging bass player, baby? The essence of jazz is swing and blues. And Ray Brown will swing, blues, and a little bit of gravy too. All right, thank you.